Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels. Available on Comcast. And welcome everyone. I'm Barbara Rimkunis, the co-executive director of the Exeter Historical Society. Tonight's program takes place in Meskwamskuk, now called Exeter in Nadakana, the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abnaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the Elnabak, the people, who have stewarded Nadakana and its Aki, Nibi, Olakwakak, and Owa'asak, the land, the waters, the flora, and the fauna throughout the generations. Thank you, Barbara. Um, my name is Laura Martin. I'm the co-executive director of the Exeter Historical Society, and I thank you for joining us tonight. Before I forget, I also want to thank uh, the students or members of Rho Kappa for helping to set up the chairs tonight. So thank you for that. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight, either in person or virtually to learn how news got from the front lines to the home front in the 1860s. I have a few announcements. Our April program will be on Tuesday, April 2nd, here and virtually. We will be celebrating US National Poetry Month with poet, journalist, author, and artist Shanta Lee as she explores the works and influence of Lucy Terry Prince, the first known African-American poet in the US. We have a new exhibit at the Historical Society. We've borrowed the Seacoast LGBTQ plus history project exhibit and we'll be holding a reception on Friday, April 12th from 4 to 7 p.m. and we hope that you can we hope to see you there. I want to thank Exeter TV for bringing all of our programs to our members and friends virtually. They are making it possible for us to reach a much larger audience and we truly appreciate it. Check our website exeterhistory.org for more information about our event our events and for more Exeter history. Tonight, if you'd like to ask a question and you're here in person, please raise your hand and wait for one of us to come to you with a microphone. Not only will it help our speaker hear you better, but it will also help those who are viewing virtually to hear you. Um, if you are on Zoom or Facebook, please put your question in the comments section and we'll try and ask it on your behalf. And now I'd like to introduce, introduce tonight's speaker. Caroline Seeke moved to Exeter in 2007 and joined the faculty at the Cooperative Middle School full time the following year. Shortly after moving to Exeter, she found herself pulled in by the force field exerted by the Exeter Historical Society. She was recruited to the Board of Trustees by the late Molly Stevenson, who was a truly remarkable friend, educator, and trustee. And that is certainly true. Caroline is the liaison between the Historical Society and the SAU 16 schools, coordinating the annual youth night and other efforts to integrate local history into social studies curriculum. One of her greatest accomplishments is raising a daughter who has turned out to be a history major in college. So, here. So thank you everyone, and that includes everybody at home. If I'm not loud enough or if I'm too loud, please somebody give a wave. Um, and I'd like to welcome everybody who came here tonight, as well as I know how I have viewers at Riverwoods and at Langdon Place and everyone watching at home. And good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. Let's go to press. I have always wanted to say that. 
Okay, so as a member of the Board of Trustees, I get to see the impact of local history and the importance of preserving it firsthand. Um, and as Laura mentioned, I am very fortunate to work at the Cooperative Middle School right here in my own hometown. So I get a lot of opportunity to learn about and reflect upon how local history intersects with and reflects the larger history of our nation and the world around us. Um, and I love that. I also enjoy coming here to talk history with people who aren't going to ask me if this is going to be on the test later. So, but it is also a little nerve wracking because I know you're actually listening. So, um, so how I came to this story starts with a program I did, I think about two years ago on the Civil War letters of John Roll of Brentwood. Um, as part of my work on that program, I was cross-referencing events that he mentioned in his letters with outside sources. Not always the easiest thing to do because he was often not terribly concerned with telling us the exact details. He would just say, somewhere outside of a town or there would be like a month in a year but no real location. So trying to cross-reference what he was up to with what was going on in the war, I wound up going into the newspapers and other records and that piqued my interest in finding out just exactly what the um, residents of Exeter knew about the Civil War and how they were learning about it. Um, I do need to caution you guys that this program is not the result of formal scholarship and my methodology probably would not pass muster in a college class or even EHS's AP US History class for that matter. This is more of an impressionistic kind of effort than a quantifiable academic study um, in part because I really was just looking mainly at the Exeter newsletter um, as it is the most easily accessible source that I had access to that I was sure had a reasonably wide local readership. Um, and it also included what we today would consider to be breaking news. Also, I wasn't looking for quantifiable data as much as I was looking to get a general impression about how the news was being covered, what my students might call the vibe, with all apologies to anyone under 18 currently hearing this. Um, I, was, I was tempted to say it was a whole mood, but I, my daughter was like, Mom, no. So it was, we'll settle for the vibe. What was the vibe of the news going on then? So bearing that in mind, we'll start with some context. Okay, so in 1860, right before the Civil War commenced, the US had a population of just under 31.5 million people, 326,000 of whom lived in New Hampshire, 3,309 um, 3, were counted as residents of Exeter. 44 of those residents were identified as free colored, which I found interesting. Um, and the US was at a time when, it, it, when the urban population is expanding and the population as a whole is expanding, but even so only one sixth of the nation lived in what would be considered an urban area. So in many ways Exeter was a, a good representative of what an American town was like in the times. Another way to ground a topic in the context of its times is by looking at the technology that was available at that particular point. And uh, the most transformative technology of the 1800s has to be the railroads. Um, so taking the railroads as our example, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad began in 1827, and more locally, the Boston and Lowell began running in 1830. By 1850, roughly half of the railroad lines in existence were located in New England. So that's a testament to both our population density, our, um, our industrialization, um, and our commercial, you know, the commercial activity. Um, all of the cities in the North and the Midwest were connected by railroad by 1860, um, and concurrently, Samuel Morse invents the telegraph um, in 1832. By 1851, 75 companies ran 21,000 plus miles of telegraph wire in the US. And they were linked very closely with railroads. This is, I hope you can see this drawing well enough. There's a very sketchy looking railroad trestle next to some very unsecured telegraph lines. So anybody who's willing to do those things was, they had great faith in, in what they were doing. Um, so 
Both railroads and the telegraph revolutionized the speed at which communication was possible. It didn't mean that um, speedy communication was accessible to the average person because sending a 10 word telegram in 1860 from New York to New Orleans cost about $2.70, which is the equivalent of about $86 today. So this was far too expensive for the average person to afford as a means of general correspondence, but it was definitely within the scope of national publications whose profits depended, especially during wartime, upon having the most recent information available. And extra residents would learn about breaking events in the war through the telegraph, but they would get only the, the most immediate details, and then they would have to wait to find out um, to get more in-depth coverage later. So the printing press then also it becomes part of this because in order to get news out, you've got to get it printed. Um, the machine press in 1814, the church typesetting machine in 1822, and lithographic rotary presses in 1843 made printed material much more widely available to the general public, much more affordable, and much quicker to receive. So where news might travel by letter, by horseback, um, by maybe a broadside, um, in say the 1700s by but the time the Civil War comes around we're getting information pretty rapidly um, and I would argue that the the transformation of technology in the 1800s is even is is as is as radical to them as you know the the cell phone and computer revolution of our time so in the midst of all this Newspapers were still a very local, um, relatively small scale endeavor compared to what we think of today. Um, newspapers usually had a small circulation. They're run with very few employees. The owner often did double or even triple duty as publisher, editor, reporter, and specialization was basically unheard of. If you worked for a newspaper, you were expected to pitch in on any task you could reasonably turn a hand to. Um, there's no such thing as a byline, which, we're, which I definitely saw reflected in the Exeter newsletter. Authors often were not listed or were listed by initials or a pseudonym. So it will be like from a reader or from GL, or they'll just report that somebody sent me a letter that said, and there's no specific um, attribution given. So um, the other thing about um, newspapers is that they are a very male endeavor. Um, out in the Western territories, some newspapers were co-published with women, mostly because of just the lack of available bodies. So women were kind of given a little bit more latitude to engage in traditionally male occupations. Um, and women did write for and run some special interest newspapers and letters. And we have an example right here in our own hometown so with the Exeter Factory Girls and Ladies Garland. But these were exceptions. For the most part, general interest newspapers are local, male run, and often affiliated with a particular political party that would subsidize their operation. This is the era of the smoke-filled back room where um, where boss party bosses and connected insiders often decided things amongst themselves and then put it out to the to the general public. Um, and newspaper editors were sometimes included in that kind of connected insider group. So let's narrow our focus and look more closely on journalism in Exeter. According to our very own esteemed curator, there were a number of local newspapers published during the revolution and in the years following. And some of them are the Exeter Gazette in 1776, the Freeman's Oracle of 1788, the Herald of Liberty of 1793, and others. Um, and she gave me quite a list. And I think given the number of papers listed that come and go, I think we can safely say that newspapering has never been an easy way to make a living. Um, and these papers often came and went so fast that even Charles Bell's history of the town missed all these, all the papers of the revolutionary era. Um, and to quote our curator, they were already lining the town bird cages by then. So we're lucky to have even the limited collection that we have. Okay. And when I was growing up, it would have been a gerbil cage, but you know, six of one, half dozen of the other. So. Bell picks up on the history of newspapers with the establishment of the weekly journal The Constitutionalist in 1810. 
Bell described it as being of fair dimensions, but fails to say what that, I don't know if that means fair dimensions of coverage, fair dimensions of size, but he said it was of fair dimensions. Um, and that paper is published in one form or another for roughly four years. Bell editorializes somewhat that in the news provided during the War of 1812 era, it was characterized by great bitterness of political feeling and by, by very unpleasant personalities in journalism, and the constitutionalist was not entirely free from them. Good thing we don't have to worry about that in the modern press anymore, isn't it? Okay. So the Constitutionalist was followed by a rather peripatetic endeavor that started off in 1816. It started off as the Watchman, eventually to become the Exeter Watchman, then the Exeter Watchman and Agricultural Repository before morphing into the Northern Republican in 1821 and ending after a run of 40 issues. Um, other attempts to, to begin regular news journals met a similar fate, although it's worth noting that a man by the name of Michael Barton tried to start a publication called Something New, which indeed tried something new, which was to, quote, introduce a perfect alphabet and a reformed orthography, end quote. The creators of Esperanto would like to have a word with him. Um, do you guys, anybody know what that reference is, Esperanto? Okay, good. <laughs> I, was hoping some, I was hoping it was a reference you guys would get. Um, so finally, we get to the Exeter Newsletter, which is instituted on May 31st of 1831 by John S. Sleeper. According to Bell, he had an easy and graceful pen and knew well the kind of matters in which the public are interested. And in a capitalist society, it's always a good idea to know your audience. So... Um, the Exeter Newsletter, more formally the Exeter Newsletter and Rockingham Advertiser, said it was devoted to morality, agriculture, mechanic arts, literature, foreign and domestic news. Um, it ran a setup that was very typical of the times, which was to have local news, classified advertisements, and what we might call special interest features on the outside pages, which could be printed further ahead of time and allowed to dry before um, the paper had to go in the mail. The inside pages included world and national news, what, was con what we would consider to be breaking news, more recent local news, and more classified ads. So knowing that, let's dive into some of the news Exeter residents were reading about during the Civil War. And I started um, by looking at the Exeter Newsletter edition from April 15th, 1861, shortly after um, the bombardment of Fort Sumter. Um, and true to form, the front pages were dedicated to local news, particularly agricultural reports. Um, a rather long and meandering story about a country lawyer and a lawsuit in involving shoes that took place at some time in the past. An essay about how to raise boys to grow up to be good men. A discussion of what is meant by the term insanity that does not include the famous definition that it's doing the same thing over again and expecting different results. Um, and there is also quite a lot of information about raising chickens. The front page news was a mix of local items, some writing specific to the newsletter, and retellings of reporting from other paper, capped off by a lugubrious and very long poem in memory of a young man who had passed away a few weeks prior. On page two, there's quite a bit of discussion about the unification of Italy under the title of foreign news. At this time, Rome fell outside of the national borders of the newly united country, and Pope Pius IX felt little compulsion to allow the Eternal City to become part of the new country, even if Rome was the most logical place to situate the capital. Um, it's interesting to note in many of these papers, there's a lot of attention paid to what is going on at the Vatican and um, what the Pope's opinions are. And we have to remember that this is a, a time period when a lot of Protestant New Englanders were a little suspicious of what was going on in that Catholic realm. And this is the era of the Know Nothing Party. And so, so there was definitely a sense that they needed to keep an eye on what the Holy See was doing. The ENL opined at the time, the Pope's last allocution has been suppressed in France. It is far less conciliatory than has been represented. 
From the way this information and other stories are relayed, it's very clear that the publisher assumes that his readers make a regular habit out of reading the paper and have done so often enough in the past to have the background knowledge you need in order to understand what they're talking about. He doesn't say what the Pope's latest allocution is. He just assumes that you know it from last week or the last time that they wrote about it. This is definitely counter to the practices in modern journalism in which every story is intended to stand alone. They give you enough of the, the, they answer the W's question for you in those first few sentences so that you have enough background and context to understand the story. Um, as a matter of fact, it's the Exeter newsletter makes absolutely zero effort to do this, and you would, and they just expect that you are either going to start reading and catch up, or maybe you're going to find out from back issues. So what does the Exeter newsletter have to say about national events, since this is the first issue to be published after the attack on Fort Sumter? The information that does address the events at Fort Sumter is much more of a compendium of viewpoints about how other nations viewed the war and what other newspapers had to say about the war than it was a recounting of the events that, of that day that took place on the ground. And this makes sense given how long it would take for full and accurate information to spread. This paper was published um, four days after the famous date of April 11th. So it's going to be that first wave of news that comes out um, and they haven't had time to gather a fuller retelling. Um, reportage from Fort Sumter includes a lot of phrases such as are said to have, are presumed to be, and, and things like that. And the one definitive statement I have read about that day that was in that edition of the paper um, ran as follows. Since the above was written, we have received the Saturday morning journal, which says under its telegraphic head, war has begun. They don't tell you the, you know, they just say the Saturday morning journal, which I assume is from the Fort Sumter area, um, because they do not tell you any name other than journal. So they're expecting that you know that as well. Um, so it was kind of like a, a chain message kind of thing. Newspapers were relying on other more local papers and then sort of picking that up and transmitting it to their local readership. One other item considered newsworthy in that edition of the paper is a somewhat meta reference about how recent events were being reported nearby in the letters to the editor. And it's, it's a report from Boston saying, from the past few days, our city, meaning Boston, has been in a rather feverish condition occasioned by the, quote, special dispatches, which have been telegraphed to the various newspapers. Each paper struggles fiercely for the supremacy in the horrible, one vying with the other in startling the community and thereby finding ready sale for thousands of extras, which would otherwise be in no demand. And I don't think I'm reading too much into the tone of this letter when I say it comes across as being rather scolding. Um, later in the letter, there is a, it's nice to know that Homerism has a long and, and great history because there's a certain amount of gloating about how New York is upset that the Italian opera had a successful run in Boston. Um, so nothing has really changed there. And, it's a, and the, the letter writer pats, and, pats our area on himself and greater Boston on the back by saying, Boston is second only to New Orleans in appreciating operatic performances. So nice to see that through line there. And nothing much has changed, has it? So. Um, and then there are other stories speculating about the tension in the U.S. Um, the paper goes on to relay, the Richmond, Virginia Whig believes that the present session of the convention in that state will result in a convention of all the border states, the border slave states, the terms on which they consent to remain in the union, then to be presented as an ultimatum. So that issue of border states versus, um, can, you know, where are the border states going to fall, that was something that was on everyone's mind from the outbreak of this war. It was not something that came about later on. You know, a lot of these questions that a lot of the things that we study, they existed right from the get-go and they were discussed very openly, including in the Exeter newsletter. Um, financial news consisted of a lot of grumbling about how the war was basically interrupting what was a strong economy um, and a lot of speculation about what's going to happen to cotton trade, um, what's going to happen to our local factories. There, was, there were several pieces in there to that effect. Locally, there was a run of bad luck when, quote, last Tuesday afternoon, the train of cars from Portland run into a flock of sheep owned by Mr. J.D. Wadley of this town, and two of them were killed. 
So agriculture is still important despite key events going on elsewhere. So um, I skipped ahead a little bit to look at an issue from February 17th in 1862 because I was interested in seeing what wartime news was like during the winter months at a time when, first of all, the war was not going terribly well for the Union and the, it, it is a less active phase of the war because it's winter time. The front page of this edition included a song, of, a song of new lyrics set to the tomb of John Brown's body, which they're guessing everybody would have been familiar with at the time, or assuming so, followed by two poems exhorting men to fight and all Exeter residents to be patriotic, a story titled Idle Men and Overworked Women, which alludes to hard times for wives of soldiers, and a dispatch from a local titled Baltimore and Baltimoreans, Baltimore Markets, and What You Can Buy There. The correspondent writes about a local theater, theatrical production, noting rather disapprovingly that a large part of the audience sit with their hats on during the performance, munch peanuts, whistle with acute sharpness, and shout vociferously at the end of sets and whenever a good point is made in the play. There's also a fictional account of the, of the life of a copper tea kettle rendered unusable by lime deposits and made useful again, thanks to applications of hydrochloric acid, which in the story they refer to as spirits of salt. It's entitled The Confessions of a Tea Kettle or Hints to Housewives. Not sure why the tea kettle and the housewives are connected, but they are there. So, um, you know, I'm not sure how widespread a scourge lime encrusted tea kettles were nationally in 1862, but at least we know how to deal with it. So, one thing I noted in that winter art edition was that a great deal of the international news was concerned with the impact of the federal blockade of the English and French economies and what that might do in the speculating about how that might affect their decision to recognize the South and along with concerns about what Louis Napoleon might do to ameliorate the, those conditions in France. The newsletter repeated a Boston Post editorial saying when the proper time comes for the great common stroke, which General McClellan, as soon as nature will allow him to deal it, will deal upon the rebellion of which there are sure precursors, then will come the arbiter that will put at rest the question of the blockade. A, his a victory is the only thing under heaven that can make the country feel safe from foreign interference with domestic affairs. So there is a great deal of concern locally about exactly like what does this mean to have England and France both possibly coming in on the side of the South and what will that in how much economic injury will it take to push them into that it was not immune to being swayed by popular opinion also um, in the case of this gentleman right here um, involving this battle down here so um, there was a blurb in that edition that the arrest of General Stone, the gentleman pictured, um, under treasonable charges removes a dangerous man from the head of one of our armies and gives general satisfaction. This refers to Charles Pomeroy Stone, who now is widely considered to have been scapegoated for an embarrassing Union defeat at the Battle of Ball's Bluff, and um, Stone was scapegoated in order to not to make McClellan look bad. Um, quick history of Ball's Bluff. It was um, somebody, a Union scout was sent out at night, I believe, and mistook a copse of trees for a Confederate camp and reported that the Confederates were there. Um, Stone was sent out to, to lead an assault against them and it all went terribly sideways and, and did not end well for the Union. So um, this was unfortunate. This man apparently acquitted himself as well as could be possible in difficult circumstances. And if he hadn't been become known for the debacle at Ball's Bluff, he would otherwise be remembered more for being the first volunteer for the Union Army. The paper does mention elsewhere in this issue that um, President Lincoln has, quote, lately taken the management of the war into his own hands, although nobody drew the connection at the time between that statement and McClellan's handling, or should we say possible mishandling of the Union effort. In more local news, this edition of the paper includes a report from the Secretary of the New Hampshire Soldiers Aid Society that two barrels of clothing and a cash donation was sent to help the newly freed. 
um, stories involving slavery, contrabands, the uh, um, commonly quoted as the Negro question, and other topics focusing on how African Americans were affected by the war and were in, and were affecting the war were regularly included in the Exeter newsletter, usually with a slant toward how well the Union was handling the issue of newly freed enslaved people and how productive the partnership was between those people and the Union Army. Finally, this edition of the paper informs the public that Mr. S. Augustus Hobbs lost his wife and daughters, two daughters, to typhoid fever, which serves as a good reminder that Exeter residents of the Civil War era had many different, and I would argue, much more difficult life experiences than what we enjoy today. So, moving on. My next foray into the archives, I decided to go shortly into papers shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg because I wanted to see what Exeter residents were told about that battle and how long it took to get that information. The first news they got was in the July 6th edition of 1863, but it, it was mentioned only in the most general terms. Quote, during the first three days of the past week, reports from the seat of war were very conflicting, and it was with extreme difficulty that the reader of the papers could ascertain anything, excepting that both Federals and relative rebels each had a large army somewhere. The public, however, having become accustomed to such reports, with nothing definite and satisfactory to feast upon, keep perfectly cool. A certain class believing everything for the best, and their opponents knowing it is all for the worst. So not much about human nature has changed there either, has it? Um, a lot more attention was given to the removal of General Hooker, AKA the fighting general. The Exeter Newsletter does quite a bit of opinionating about Hooker was a competent general, followed by, quote, it is questionable whether his removal at this juncture of our affairs is not productive of less good than evil. His farewell burns with patriotism. So news about Gettysburg was more forthcoming in the July 13th edition, so the following week, but it was far overshadowed by news of Grant's victory in Vicksburg. Under news of the week, the Exeter Newsletter states, when this event was announced officially by Telegraph and through the press to the country, the inhabitants as one grand multitude united in a general rejoicing. And it, that's all about Vicksburg. There's very, very little about Gettysburg there. So in, from what I saw in my, again, admittedly, very um, unscientific survey of this and other editions of the paper, Vicksburg was seen at the time through the eyes of the Exeter Newsletter as being by far the more important of the two victories, which raises a really interesting question about interpretation. What if the phrase, the high water mark of the Confederacy, had never been coined? What if Lincoln had made his famous remarks at another location after a different battle? Um, how would our understanding of, of the Battle of Gettysburg be different in, in that case if those things had happened? Like, when did Vic Gettysburg start being seen as equally as important to, if possibly not more important than the, the success at Vicksburg? So, inquiring minds want to know, but I am not gonna find that out tonight. So, to wrap up my survey of um, local news. I decided to move ahead. Um, I picked an edition from March 27th, 1865. I wanted to gauge the tenor of the paper when the war was effectively all but over, but before Lincoln's assassination. Most of the war news at this point was dedicated to um, news about Sherman's and Grant's advances in the South, but it was mostly, there was a lot of speculation about the political and social outcome of the war. What's going, what are things like now in the defeated Confederacy? What is going to happen next and what direction are we going to go in? Um, there's a fair deal of rose-colored glasses wearing going on. Um, I think in how the news is presented. Um, one news article recaps a story reportedly published in the Savannah Republican stating, quote, the market is very well supplied now with all the substantials of life, such as beef, mutton, pork, fish, oysters, et cetera, et cetera. We presume that many of our old citizens will soon be convinced that the Yankees are not such bad people after all. And as a lady remarked the other day, if you call this subjugation, I want more of it. Maybe I'm just cynical, but I'm not gonna take this as conclusive evidence of a widespread change of heart among the residents of the Confederate States as of March, 1865. 
Um, the Exeter newsletter also has a little sidebar under the title of items um, that says, the New York Tribune says it has private information that Lee has notified Jeff Davis that it is impossible with the means at his command to make head against the Union forces now concentrating for his overthrow. And this is pretty accurate information given that Lee will surrender at Appomattox Courthouse within the next two weeks. So here are some impressions I gained from my time wandering through the archives. First of all, it's really fun to just start spelunking in the old Exeter newsletters. And if you have nothing better to do in an, in an evening and there's nothing good on cable, just pick an edition from some random time in the past and you'll start falling down rabbit holes like what, what, was, what were Pope Pius the, the Ninth's policies exactly anyway? And why is Louis Napoleon so wound up about this? And you know, one thing leads on to another and pretty soon you find yourself an expert in things nobody has asked you about ever, and, and, but you will tell them anyway. Um, what did strike me overall was how well informed the readers of the Exeter newsletter were about the war and its progress. Because the war took place in a point in time after communications technology had advanced, but before the implications of those changes were really fully in understood, there were fewer official limits on what could and could not be disseminated as war news. This would change in future conflicts. Um, as the US government um, came to understand that controlling information was a critical part of any war effort, but at the time of the Civil War, a lot of information was being shared very freely through Letters Home, you know, through these newspapers, etc. Generally, the, te the tenor of the Exeter newsletter was pro-Union, pro-Lincoln, and pro-whoever was in charge of the Union Army at the time. Um, the coverage generally skewed optimistic, or at least as positive as it could be under the circumstances. Um, and for example, the Exeter newsletter did cover the terrible draft riots of 1863 shortly before the Battle of Gettysburg, but unlike other war news, it was re reported upon once as a major news event and then only referenced briefly afterwards, while other events and battles were discussed multiple times in detail um, over the course of several weeks. So through several additional editions of the paper, they would be talking about an outcome of a battle or a specific decision in the army. The draft riot Riots, they got a, they got a, an, an article like one mention the following week and then they just disappeared um, I also noticed that the newspaper had a very conversational tone um, it reads very much like a discussion among friends um, where we are used to a much more one-way transmission of information model and if I had to place the tone of the newspaper on a spectrum I'd put it much closer to reading the old farmers almanac than perusing a modern New York Times um, there were, this was not a publication that you would scan or you just read in one sitting and then discard the next day for a new edition um, it was meant for you to peruse it over several sittings perhaps reading out loud a significant tidbit to family members when you're sitting around the table after dinner, sharing a recent copy with a neighbor. Um, it was, and it was in kind of a dialogue with their readers as well. A lot, of, a lot of the articles turn out to be submissions from readers who want to engage with previous things the Exeter Newsletter has published or they want to talk about their impressions of, say, a piece in Harper's Weekly or something like that. The readers of the Exeter Newsletter definitely trusted their source. And I go back to that story about the lady in Savannah who supposedly was relieved that her city was back under union control when they give no name, they give no address, there's, there's no way to confirm any part of that story without expending time and effort probably far beyond um, what that story was, the worth of do, putting all that effort forward. For all we know, she was actually shaking her fist and railing at the Union occupation. Maybe she was saying, if this is subjugation, you know, you can go take it with you back north, but we don't, we don't know. So this brought me to consider the impact shared news has on us as a society. Unlike today, the residents of Exeter couldn't change the channel or find a major news outlet that aligned more closely with their own, the, the views they already held. Um, in the past, our viewpoints were much more reliant on who, where, where we are in addition to who we are. Um, because geographically we shared our source of news through the newsletter, um, there were other sources, but the newsletter was the one you'd go to locally. Um, 
the, what the newsletter printed tended to reflect the community's feeling and influence the community's feeling. So it had much more sh common perspective, I think, than we have today, where we can go out and find sources that have multiple different perspectives. So when we bemoan the fractured nature of our society, I have to wonder what Exeter residents of the Civil War era would think of us and what we've made from the information we have at our disposal. Just like the, Exeter, the editor of the Exeter newsletter, I choose to be optimistic. And I believe that after our unsettling times, just like in 1865, wiser heads will prevail and better days await. So thank you. And I would love to answer questions. We will have questions. Whoop. Thank you very much, Caroline. Was there any mention of exploits of Exeter men in the battles or like a report from an officer who, oh, yeah, who there was, was from a, Exeter yep. who said this happened and so forth? Oh yeah, there's, I've, I have spared you all a lot of information that I found. Um, there are some great stories um, of either talking about regiments, you know, like the second New Hampshire did this or talking about you know so-and-so reports having come back to Exeter that he saw that. There's a great little, little um, story about um, somebody who came home and was had his arm amputated by I think the Perry doctors and talking about where the bullet went in and how it smashed his elbow and and so forth and so on um, and how he got through it without chloroform I think is part of it so yeah there was there's a lot about um, local reportage local people um, either contributing or as the subject front page no, no, so um, only if it was looking back at something, you know, like somebody wrote a poem about it or something like that. The front page had very limited um, immediate or war news, and it was mostly inside. Second and third page is going to be where you find the meaty, the meaty stuff. What did the paper call the war? Uh, did they call it the Civil War or the War of the Rebellion? Um, they call it a range of things. So at, at very first, it, in the first, the 1861, it's the rebellion, it's the uprising, it's, it's sometimes called the war between the state. Um, Oftentimes, they don't really call it the Civil War consistently. Um, they will call it this great conflict, the, the War of the Secession. So it, it's quite a range of, you know, again, they kind of assume, you know, well, we're all talking about the same thing here. So consistency and nomenclature wasn't, wasn't their first goal. A very good presentation. Uh, just as a side note, I, I was born and raised on the last battle of the Civil War, so um, down in Alabama. Uh, uh, I been in town for about 35 years, and the Exeter Mill has always fascinated me. As as uh, and I had heard that, that it was actually producing uh, wool blankets for the Union soldiers. Did you run across any information about anything like that that Exeter might have dealt with? Um, I did not, but I also wasn't necessarily looking, like I was specifically look, looking at war news. They do mention like the output of the mills and so forth. There's some, every once in a while they get a little nervous about like, how are we going to keep these mills going and we need to produce. Do you have any insight into that, Barbara? The mill that's in the downtown is a cotton textile mill, so it wasn't set up to do wool textiles. If there was wool that was being done, it was somewhere else. The cotton mill in the downtown actually shut down the first two years, and they sold all of their back stock raw cotton to make sure that the shareholders got paid. So they laid off all the workers. 
and they made sure that they got money. Then the third and fourth years of the war, they started to get back online slowly. Where they got their cotton from is a question I haven't been able to answer. They do not seem to have been bringing it in from India, which some places did, but doesn't seem common in Exeter. There are advertisements in other newspapers where they're asking people to, and this is a little disgusting, but they would say, go into your old mattress and take out the cotton that stuffed it and we will make it into fabric. So you could have people's night sweat in your fabric. It's disgusting. I don't really like thinking about it. But, so I'm not sure where they got it. They were on a very diminished capacity for those final two years, but they did fire, hire some more people back. And there's talk in town about how the economy is very low because people are out of work. So that was troublesome for the time period. Um, and it, if I did an economic history, I would definitely, you know, but there's a, most, most of what I see is a lot of talking about like England and, and France are going to need cotton and they're going to, they're going to recognize the South and it's going to be terrible and this blockade is not helping us out. So there was a little negativity around that. And then um, I didn't continue, like, I'm sure they continue to talk about it. I just didn't see it in the, in the um, edition. I'm just guessing, but maybe they got some of their cotton whenever they managed to seize some of the stores from oh, the definitely. south that could yeah. be too but i never heard it referenced in the newsletter but that's a possibility just guessing don't count that as fact <laughs> so even the local deaths were not on the front page i mean now the obituaries you know are on page 17 or something but but would the local deaths from war injuries or from battles be also like on page four, five, six, not the front page? As breaking news, definitely it would be interior. Um, if they were, there were definitely, um, there were references to war dead on that front page generally is like in memoriam, like poems or, you know, stories about, there, there's a lot of um, talk about, you know, giving over to God and trusting that, you know, he is guiding us to better days and, and referencing the the high death toll and so forth. But um, generally speaking, if it was like news that so-and-so has died or these regiments have had this many casualties, that's page two and three. But you didn't see any casualty lists as such. I did not. I don't remember seeing them either. I was wondering about that. I couldn't remember. Thank you very much. Um, it just struck me, did um, the Exeter newsletter have the wherewithal to send a journalist out no. to, to the, the battlefront to travel and get news and bring it back? Definitely not. They were really relying on, um, there's a lot of discussion in the paper about Harper's Weekly says, etc. Um, and so it was kind of like a, you know, a game of telephone in that, you know, one paper says something, another paper picks it up and reports it, a paper moves along. Do we know what the, um, how many employees the Exeter newsletter had? I think it was like about three. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say three or four. Eventually the newsletter expands and they start having correspondents from other towns. So there would be a correspondent from Fremont, but not, not, they wouldn't send reporters away. They had a Washington correspondent for a while, but that was as close as we get, and that's not till later. They do publish letters and um, sort of retellings of information from soldiers on the front. You know, somebody will say, I got a letter from my cousin, and he reports that in Savannah, and then you're sort of at the mercy of whatever struck that person's interest in Savannah. So you couldn't count on it being like, these are the action, you know, it, it was very idiosyncratic what people saw and absorbed and wanted to relay on. Thank you so much for talking tonight. Uh, so my question is, a, is, as a teacher, how has this kind of information that you've been learning affected the way you approach teaching the Civil War in the classroom? Um, 
I love giving them, especially the classified ads, they're awesome, especially when the, the ones for things like caskets, where go pick out your casket and you can have it ready to go whenever you need it. Um, you know, makes fun, makes a great coffee table. Um, so I love having them look at classified ads. Um, I do talk about the lack of military secrecy, and I'll show them, you know, I'll show them a snippet from local news. And, um, you know, we talk, when you talk about John Brown, you know, John Brown's body, that, that's, that song was just ubiquitous, you know, and, and it gets rewritten locally for this local audience with these new lyrics and so forth. So it's, it's great to throw in those snippets. Um, I, I love, I, I tell every year, because kids love grizzly stuff. Um, I don't know what his rank was, Pavir, the, the man right. who went to Gettysburg, he gets shot in the eye and he's left for dead and he wakes up and he coughs the mini A ball out into his hand because it went in through his sinus and out his, and, and I have it like I get five minutes of spellbound attention every year for that one. It's great. It's a great story. Um, so those kinds of things um, and showing them like, look guys, when you walk downtown, the Civil War is everywhere. It is everywhere around us, especially here in New England. Um, it's just, we're, we're not as conscious of it. So when you start making them aware of like, look at this statue and look at that, look at that, that says GAR on it, that's Grand Army of the Republic. You can just get them to see that we're really, there's, the Civil War is really still everywhere if you know where to look. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much for being a good audience. Caroline. Thank you all for coming out this evening to see our program. And we'll see you next month. Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's 